Okay, so today uh, I'm going to be talking about HPLC, uh, High Performance Liquid Chromatography, and specifically this lecture is mainly about the instrumentation um, and some of the things that are uh, specific to HPLC. All right, so there's two types of HPLC, really. Uh, one is called normal phase, and the other one is called reverse phase. And so normal phase uh, um, LC uses a polar stationary phase and a non-polar mobile phase, right? So that means whatever I have on my column is going to be polar, and then whatever I'm going to dissolve it in is going to be non-polar, like some sort of organic solvent. So the elution order then of my analytes, right, if the stationary phase um, is um, polar, right, then this is nonpolar. It means the nonpolar things are going to want to come out first because they're going to want to stay in the stationary, sorry, in the mobile phase. And then the polar ones are going to come out last because they're going to be more retained. All right, so for reverse phase, we have the opposite. We have a nonpolar stationary phase. And then we have a polar mobile phase. And so um, uh, then you would expect, right, the elution order, which ones come out first, right, is the opposite. It ends up being polar ones come out first and non-polar ones come out second. Um, so again, think to yourself about what we're going to do in the lab if you've read the experiment. Um, and then just about everything that's done today, 95%, right, of, of all LC done today is reverse phase. So this is a case where, you know, um, history is not on our side. Chromatography started with um, normal phase, and then when they decided to flip it around, they called that reverse phase, and nowadays we all are in reverse. So we're all doing reverse phase chromatography, and so the elution order for your separation should be polar uh, to nonpolar. So let's talk just a little bit about the stationary phase then, again, thinking about what's actually in that instrument that we really can't see. Um, and so the most common stationary phases have a silica particle uh, kind of as its core. And typically, these particles are somewhere in the 3 to 5 micron diameter range. And again, one of the things they're doing nowadays is pushing to smaller particles. Uh, but that's a typical par par um, um, particle size. Um, and so this phase then, uh, you have a small core, uh, and then what we have um, bound to it, so these silica groups, you can do silica chemistry. Um, and so what we'll typically get is something that looks like this. So we'll make a bond off of a, um, off of a silicate, and, uh, and then we'll usually on this side have some sort of long chain. And so what we have in our lab is C18. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 carbons going off. Hopefully I didn't go off the board for that you can see. 18 carbons going off on this chain. Uh, and so, um, you know, this is what it actually looks like. You can do, um, you know, the organic reaction. You guys have taken organic, so let's do the organic reaction, right? So you have silicate here, right? And you'd just be um, uh, combining it um, with uh, some sort of uh, chloral um, uh, silicate group over here. And so you make um, your... Um, bonds there, and then you'd have your sort of C18 chain off of there. So oftentimes what we do then, if we want to think about our particle, and again, I, I have to admit, these are not drawn to scale, right? Uh, 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 the core would actually be huge compared to the chain, right? We can think of it as having these chains of hydrocarbons sticking out, right? So that's how we get the nonpolar part, and again, Think massive core, small chain, but I never draw it like that. Uh, so this is this is what's in there, and again, it has a C18. There's really two popular stationary phases, C18 and C8. Uh, if you use a longer chain, so C18 is a little bit of a longer chain, and it's probably the most common, quite frankly, uh, stationary phase. You get more interactions. 
with the stationary phase. And so that means you get a better separation. You also tend to get a little bit more band broadening. So in the, in the lecture on sort of chromatography theory, I talked about the terms for band broadening. And one of those is the C term, and that has to do with whether or not your analyte can get buried in there. So you have a longer chain, and it's more likely that you know, your analyte can come and get kind of buried in the chain up there rather than being at the edge. Again, if you had C8, um, you would have a shorter chain. Uh, but you also have less interactions, right? You have less of the non-polar group to have interactions. So your separation wouldn't be as good, but you would also get less band broadening. Each column that we buy for the lab is actually a couple hundred dollars, so please don't ruin it. Um, uh, but so you can change columns, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. Um, you know, so you usually design your separation quite frankly around the column that you have. Uh, but that's what's in the, that's what's actually in the um, column. Okay, so for um, chromatography, there's a slight problem sometimes that comes about. Um, so when we have a chromatogram, this is a very extreme case of a chromatogram, um, we oftentimes get very sharp peaks at first. Uh, but peaks that stay in the column a long time end up having a lot of band broadening. So they're low and wide. And so the problem is that that's not very easy for separations when we get out there. Um, and so, um, the, uh, again, the problem is just separating really a lot of compounds with very different polarities. And so the solution to this, so this chromatogram is what I'll call isocratic. So isocratic just means you have one mobile phase. So you, you, you pick a composition of a mobile phase, you leave it at that, you go. Um, but the solution to getting things, these ones to come out faster, is gradient elution. Uh, and so for gradient elution, what you usually do is start with a mobile phase that's more aqueous. Again, we're doing reverse phase. And over time, you add in more organic. In our lab, we usually use acetonitrile as the organic. So that's more nonpolar, right? So it's going to push stuff out. These things that are coming out uh, are the most nonpolar things. We add a little bit more nonpolar something to the mobile phase, it's going to push them out faster. And so what you get, again, for gradient elution is much faster separations. And so we're going to explore that um, a little bit in our lab, the difference between doing isocratic and gradient. Uh, but a lot of times people like gradient elution just because it gets your peaks out faster while still allowing you to separate things uh, sort of in the beginning. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the parts of VLC. Let's talk a little bit about the instrumentation. So we have almost a fully automated LC, so that's really good and really bad. The really bad part is you don't get to do much. The really good part is it does it all really well. Uh, so I want you to kind of know what's under the hood. Uh, so once your sample is put in a vial, right, it's got to be injected. And almost all HPLCs use something called a six-pore valve uh, for the injection. And you see these commonly in other places, too. So let's imagine a valve for a minute. And there are going to be six ports on this valve. One, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. Um, and so um, you can imagine uh, that inside the valve, what happens uh, is that we have little connections. And so these connections start, let's say first one is connected to six, two is connected to three, and four is connected to five. And on the outside of these valves, we have different things coming in. Um, so um, 
between um, uh, 6 and 3, for instance, we might have a loop. Uh, and so this loop, it literally is called a loop, it uh, holds your sample. And so this loop is of a discrete volume. Um, and our manual injection C LC, which we're not using this year, um, it holds like 10 microliters. So you shoot in, this loop holds a precise volume. So that's how you get the same volume every time. Um, and then um, uh, this one coming out might go to the column, let's say. Um, and then uh, this one might be from the pump. Right, so we have a pump that needs to pump in. So the pump might be pumping in and going through the column. And so this is the initial way that it would be going, right? If I'm not putting any analyte in, it just, you know, it goes from the pump through the column, right? These two are connected. It doesn't see this loop. All right, so how am I going to do this loop? I need one thing coming into the loop that's from my syringe. So my syringe is going to go in, and that's going to be able to load that loop. And then this is just a waste. Uh, so in the initial sort of load stage, I'm going to load my stuff in my loop. If I put extra in, it's going to go to waste. All right, so now I want to make an injection in my experiment. What am I going to do? I'm going to um, now switch my valve. And so the valve literally switches. And so instead of it being connected by those black lines, it's going to be connected like this. Now one is going to be connected to two, three is going to be connected to four, and five is going to be connected to six. And there are actually little challenge channels, and this thing actually turns, like just a little quarter turn. And so now what's happening, you see, the pump is coming into four, so now the pump is going to pump through the loop, and the loop is going to go to the column. And so that's how it makes an injection. It turns, it pumps through the loop, then it usually turns back and you can load your next sample in. You don't see all of this, but this is how it makes a precise injection again and again. And that's really important. If you don't inject the same amount every time, how are you going to expect to get a very quantitative uh, separation? So this is a very precise way of doing it. All right, so we'll skip from injecting to detecting. The other end of the LC, right, is the detector. Uh, and so in this lab, for our first LC experiment, we use UV-Vis uh, as the detector. Um, and so the advantages of UV-Vis is that it's fairly universal, but the disadvantage is it's not particularly selective. So universal, but not particularly um, uh, selective, and not particularly sensitive. It's not terrible, but it'll detect universal. If you um, remember back to spectroscopy, means basically anything's got a double bond. So you got to have a double bond to see it with UV bits. Got a double bond um, or some sort of n orbital, you're usually um, pretty good to go. Um, remember back to um, this equation that absorbance is equal to molar absorptivity times path length times concentration uh, that we use all the time in sort of our initial studies. Um, uh, the, um, again, let's think about path length for a minute. So I think our columns nowadays are very narrow. They're usually only a couple, like, hundred microns, like a 200 micron column. So if we try and just do, you know, shine our, you know, put our light bulb over here, that's a really bad light bulb, uh, you know, and make our measurement over a tiny little um, column, right, that's only like 200 microns, we're not going to get much absorbance. We're going to be limited by the path length. So they've solved this problem by making a different type of cell in our detector, and the cell is called a Z cell. And so what they do is look at it like uh, this. And so your sample will flow in, and then it'll flow crossways, and it'll go out. And your UV light comes in this way, and you detect over here. So now, right, by this design, my path length is a lot longer. It's not the length of the column. It's not the width of the column, uh, but we can make an optically transparent sort of length. Uh, and so this Z cell is what's used in all chromatography. But if you did it over the path there, you get almost no absorbance and you have like no sensitivity. 
So UV base is pretty um, universal um, as far as that being used. There are other things you can use though. Um, you could use fluorescence. Um, it's very sensitive, so that's the, that's the pro to doing fluorescence. The con is that you must almost always tag your molecule. That most things are not fluorescent, and so if you want to do a fluorescence detection, you got to make sure it's fluorescent. If it's not, you got to tag it. So that's kind of difficult. You could do electrochemistry. And the same sort of thing. Um, your molecule needs to be electroactive. And so that is somewhat limiting. You get the right set of molecules you want to look at. Like I like to look at neurotransmitters. They're all electroactive, so they're really good for this. Uh, we do a lot of HPLC with electrochemistry detection in my field. But in reality, it's sort of limited in its applications. Um, and then, what's become pretty popular nowadays, if you have more money to spend, uh, you can do mass spectrometry, right? And the advantage of mass spectrometry, right, is that you get molecular weight information about your sample, and so it's easier to use this to identify it, right? With uv -Bis, just about everything absorbs, so you're not going to get much identification. You know, the bad part, is, of course, is that it's more expensive. Uh, but, um, you know, there are separate lectures on the types of mass spectrometry um, uh, that we're using kind of thing. Where's the future of um, uh, HPLC going? I just want to spend one minute on that. Um, we're doing HPLC, but actually if you read the um, side of the instrument, it might say this. It might say UPLC. And you might say, what's the U for? Um, so the U stands for ultra-high. So UPLC is ultra high pressure liquid chromatography. And so basically they've really improved the instruments in say the last 10 years. Um, and so it all has to do with the fact that you're now able to use smart, smaller particle sizes. And you say, well, gee, you told me I wanted to use smaller particle sizes because of the um, eddy diffusion. But before, what was limiting was the pumps. So the smaller the particles you use, the harder it is actually to push against them. Um, you don't get much volume in between the particles. And so the pumps have been improved to allow higher pressures. And so if you can do higher pressures, you can do smaller particles. If you can do smaller particles, you can actually do much faster separations and better separations. And so almost everything out there now, they all like to tout it as UPLC instead of HPLC, but it's all the same theory. 